So, as you might have noticed, diplomacy isn't doing very well in Ukraine. Despite endless talks between Putin and basically every big world leader, nothing's been agreed and an invasion looks likelier than ever. So, in this video we thought we'd try and bridge the epistemological gap between Russia and the West and try our best to understand how Russia sees NATO. If you're enjoying our coverage of these ongoing tensions, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when we post more updates. Thanks for your support. So, before we get into it, a couple of disclaimers. We should be clear from the outset that, in explaining Russia's perspective on NATO, we're not endorsing it. We're doing this video on how Russia sees NATO because A, it helps explain the current crisis and B, it's something that hasn't been particularly well covered in the media. It's also worth saying that obviously Russia isn't one ideologically cohesive bloc. Not everyone in either Russia or the Russian political establishment sees NATO in the same way. So, just to be clear, when we talk about how Russia sees NATO, we're essentially talking about what the current Kremlin establishment claims to believe about NATO. Anyway, disclaimers aside, let's get into it. As we see, there are three places where the Russian and Western perspectives on NATO diverge. First, while NATO and the West see NATO as primarily a mutual defence pact, Russia doesn't consider NATO to be a purely defensive alliance. Second, Russia doesn't see NATO as an exclusively military alliance, it also sees it as a political and cultural project. Third, Russia sees NATO not as a post-World War II phenomenon, but a continuation of the West's anti-Russian foreign policy, which began in the early 17th century. Alright, let's start with the first one, the idea that NATO isn't a purely defensive alliance. NATO's official policy states that the alliance does not seek confrontation and poses no threats to Russia, and the only bit in NATO's founding charter that talks about military action is Article 5, a mutual defence clause which says that if NATO members suffer an armed attack, then all other members will defend it. On its website, NATO rejects the idea that NATO is aggressive, insisting that NATO is a defensive alliance. You get the point. NATO clearly self-perceives as a defensive alliance. Russia, however, isn't convinced. And to be fair to them, NATO does have a history of getting involved in conflicts that doesn't really involve its own members. The cases cited most often by Russia are Kosovo and Libya. Let's start with Kosovo, where NATO intervened in 1999. At the time, US-Russian relations were already at a low following the election of a former KGB agent as Russian Prime Minister in September 1998 and the US bombing of Iraq in December 1998. Iraq and Russia were allies and the Americans failed to notify Russia in advance. NATO-Russia relations were also strained in part because the Americans and the Russians weren't getting on, but also because NATO had just accepted Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic in March 1999 all former members of the Warsaw Pact. On the 23rd of March 1999, Javier Solana announced that NATO would begin a bombing campaign in Yugoslavia against the Serb armies, in order to prevent, quote, humanitarian catastrophe. Somewhat unsurprisingly, this didn't go down well with the Russians. Although Yugoslavia and Russia weren't formal allies at the time, Serbs and Russians share a Slavic and Christian Orthodox history, and Russian nationalists describe NATO's bombing campaign as an attack on their Slavic brothers. Now, the Russians never really bought NATO's claim that the bombing campaign in Kosovo was a humanitarian intervention, not least because NATO failed to gain the approval of the UN Security Council, and the campaign itself killed at least 488 Yugoslav civilians. At a time when NATO-Russian tensions were already strained, Russia saw NATO's involvement in Kosovo as setting a dangerous precedent allowing NATO to get involved in conflicts outside of its borders as long as it could come up with some semi-plausible humanitarian pretext. Putin himself described Kosovo independence as a terrible precedent that breaks up the entire system of international relations. From Russia's perspective, in 1999 NATO was expanding towards Russia, which doesn't have a great human rights record, while at the same time saying that we can bomb non-NATO countries for humanitarian reasons. It's a similar story with Libya, where NATO intervened in March 2011 to put an end to Gaddafi's brutal regime against Libyan rebels. While Russia abstained on UN Security Council Resolution 1973, which authorised member states to take, quote, all necessary measures, Russia considered NATO's subsequent campaign excessive and therefore illegal. 
When the UN tried to pass a similar resolution regarding Syria, Russia vetoed it, a clear sign that they didn't like what happened in Libya and weren't planning on letting it happen again. Russia didn't like NATO's overreach in Libya for a couple of reasons. At the time, Russia was trying to convince Gaddafi to give the Russian navy access to a port in the Mediterranean, and Russian companies were investing in Libyan oil reserves. NATO's intervention and the subsequent chaos ruined all of that. But most of all, Russia saw NATO's involvement in Libya as proof that NATO had become even more activist in its interventions. After all, Libya didn't threaten NATO in any way, and had even begun to cooperate actively with Western governments in key areas such as nuclear disarmament. You get the point. After Libya and Kosovo, Russia began to see NATO not merely as a defensive alliance, but also an offensive one that uses the pretext of humanitarian intervention to justify aggressive actions. Russia sees NATO's member support for Ukraine in a similar light. Ukraine is not a NATO member, but NATO has nonetheless decided to get involved. Now, in NATO's defence, it's worth saying that NATO's action in Libya was supported by the Arab League and involved 14 Arab coalition members, and the UN International Commission of Inquiry on Libya found no breach of UN SCR 1973, or international law, concluding instead that NATO conducted a highly precise campaign with demonstrable determination to avoid civilian casualties. It's also worth saying that NATO would claim that both interventions were genuinely humanitarian, but, well, apparently the Russians don't buy it. On to the second difference. Russia sees NATO as a cultural and political project as well as a military one. One of the reasons that Russia is so wary of Ukraine joining NATO is that Russia believes that NATO membership will also make Ukraine more politically and culturally Western. And, well, Putin doesn't like the idea of a functioning Western-style democracy on his doorstep. And this is sort of true. NATO is nominally based on democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law, and tends to only admit members who share, quote, Western cultural ideals. Spain only joined in 1982, after a successful transition to democracy. In 1991, NATO told the Visegrad countries that membership was conditional on economic and democratic liberalisation, and Slovakia was excluded from the 1997 Madrid summit because of undemocratic behaviour by nationalist Prime Minister Vladimir Mechia. NATO's membership action plans, first introduced in 1999, require members to uphold the rule of law, individual rights and democracy. You get the point. NATO does usually require member states to commit to the so-called Western cultural ideals of democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law. Now, this might not sound controversial. Democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law all sound like good things. But Putin sees this apparent concern for human rights as a threat to Russia's political culture. The third and final way that Russian and Western perceptions of NATO diverge concerns history. To understand this point, you need to know that Russian politics, and especially Putin, are big on their history. This was apparent in Putin's recent speech in Ukraine, where he made reference to the Kievan Rus, a 9th to 13th century confederal state covering parts of present-day Ukraine, Belarus and Western Russia, when describing Ukrainians and Russians as one people. Anyway, most of the West sees NATO as essentially a peacekeeper, there to prevent a repeat of World War II. Putin, however, claims to see NATO as a continuation of an anti-Russian animus in Europe that predates World War II. In Russian historical memory, Russians have suffered five invasions from what it sees as the West. The Polish occupation of the Kremlin in the early 17th century, the Swedish attacks in the early 18th century, the Napoleon invasion of 1812, and two wars with Germany in the first half of the 20th century. All of these were mentioned in Putin's recent speech on Ukraine, where he argued that the EU and the US were inspired by the, quote, Polish-Austrian ideologists of the 16th century. Putin then argued that NATO was doing what the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Austro-Hungarian Empire and Nazi Germany had all done before, using Ukraine as an anti-Russian springboard. Now, leaving aside whether Putin's reading of history is accurate, the point is that while the West sees NATO as a post-World War II peacekeeping project, Putin apparently sees NATO as just another anti-Russian project. So that's how we think Russia sees NATO.
As a final thing, we should say that none of us are proper scholars of Russian or Russian history, so if you disagree with anything we've said, leave a comment down below. We're more than happy to be corrected. Regardless, also comment down below what you expect to happen next in Ukraine. Will this escalate yet further? Will Russia really invade? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers for making videos like this one possible, and if you want to see your name at the end of videos just like these people, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is down below.